Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for giving me the chance to present at the RMA conference for 2018. Um, today's brief discussion will be on necrotizing fasciitis. Uh, it was a retrospective review of the outcomes in cases in Far North Queensland managed in Cairns over a 10-year period. Um, just an outline of the talk. We'll go through a bit of the background, have a chat about the results, discussion, the clinical significance for rural and remote Australia, and just a few questions at the end. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm currently a surgical registrar in John Hunter in Newcastle, New South Wales. Um, I grew up in regional New South Wales and Tamworth and went to medical school at James Cook University. I uh, spent a lot of time in regional Queensland with placements in the Torres Strait and the Cape and my interests lie in becoming a rural general surgeon. In terms of research interests, I'm, I'm interested in the management of surgical diseases in rural regional centres. So I want to address certain things about what are our limitations as rural practitioners and what should we be able to handle and what temporising measures can we put in place before transfer. I guess the way to answer these questions is to, is to do the data and to look at audits and to see what is appropriate and what's not. Uh, a bit of a background about regional Queensland. So Cairns Hospital is a secondary referral hospital. They uh, provide specialist cover for far north Queensland. It's got about 500 overnight beds. And it's a large coverage of about 140,000 square kilometres. Geographically, Cairns covers up to north, up to Mossman, west to Croydon and south to Cardwell. But it accepts referrals from the Cape, from Weeper, from Torres Strait and on occasion from P&G as well. Now, with, with such a big demographic area, you know, large distances need to be travelled before cairns can be reached, and this often results in delayed presentations for both all medical, surgical and obstetric emergencies. For the topic of this discussion, surgical emergencies um, can be problematic. You know, conditions such as appendicitis, cholecystitis, bowel obstructions, for example, can be managed, I guess, conservatively, and you do have a certain time period before surgical intervention is needed. But when you talk about conditions like a perforated viscous trauma, necrotizing fasciitis, temporizing measures aren't really applicable where surgical intervention is needed. And we know patients in regional Queensland do poorly because access to specialist health care is, is quite hard to get. So we'll talk about necrotizing fasciitis. So it's a surgical emergency, carries a mortality of up to 20%. It's often polymicrobial infection, toxin-producing virulent bacteria. It's characterized by fascial necrosis, relative sparing of skin underlying muscle, and its progression is really rapid without treatment. The obvious risk factors include diabetes, smoking, obesity, and a couple of things that I've looked at in this audit is, um, I guess, race and geographical location. In terms of treatment, the gold standard by any means is urgent surgical debridement. This is often at secondary or tertiary centres with access to general surgery, orthopaedics and plastics, broad spectrum intravenous antibiotics and then supportive measures. Well, obviously these patients are floridly septic when they do arrive and require intensive care admissions, renal replacement therapy and anotropic support. Um, there's a lot of evidence for hyperbaric oxygen therapy, but the reason I've written it's controversial is these centres are in major metropolitan cities and I recently spoke to a surgeon in Sydney. Um, where they have hyperbaric medicine, I did ask them, you know, how many cases of necrotizing fasciitis do you see, and it's slim. You know, they're treating, they're using their chambers for athletes for recovery, and it's controversial because the patients that need it don't have access to it. So, what's the relevance for this? Um, I guess this talk. So, I, I want to look at distances where surgical treatment is delayed. Does it affect mortality for necrotizing fasciitis? And if so, should we be offering debridement at rural centres or expedite retrieval? I also want to look at the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population. Um, theoretically, I guess they're a bit higher risk due to comorbid conditions such as diabetes. And if so, what conditions can we optimise to improve their outcomes? And we want to look at what other factors play a role in mortality from necrotizing fasciitis. So what do we do? It was a, a retrospective chart review of all cases of necrotizing fasciitis treated at Cairns Hospital from 2001 to 2012. Patient characteristics that we looked at included demographics, comorbidities, geographical location and disease factors. We performed very, I guess, basic statistical analysis using SPSS with just univariate logistical regressions. And the main outcome we were interested in was essentially death. So results. We had 66 cases over 12 years. The mortality was 18%, which is consistent with current literature. The majority of patients required an intensive care admission, but interestingly, half our cases were retrievals from rural centres. So overall, um, the average age was 54 and there was a male predominance. Looking at comorbidities, the main ones we looked at were smoking and diabetes, and smoking, about half the group were smokers, but in terms of survival, there was no statistical significance. 
Diabetes mellitus, again, most common comorbidity with 60% of the population, almost 92% in the deceased group, and this was statistically significant. In fact, it carried a tenfold increase in risk of mortality from necrotizing fasciitis when present. This is a common and expected finding, really. Um, other comorbidities such as ischemic heart disease and peripheral vascular disease and chronic kidney disease were not looked at due to subjectivity. It's hard to actually quantify, and you'll see in the notes, they may have ischemic heart disease, but you can't find if they've had an ANGO or any other clinical evidence for that. So that's a limitation of this retrospective review. We then looked at race. So we looked at the breakdown in ATSI, Caucasian and Asian is what we broke down our population into. So half the population was Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. 30% um, were Caucasian and Asian was 20%. Um, doing a univariate analysis, we found race was not statistically significant in predicting mortality from necrotizing fasciitis. So it's interesting. So half our population were in ATSI population where it increases from contracting, but mortality was not demonstrated. Now, in a brief literature review, I looked at similar studies in the US, New Zealand, and one done in Darwin a little while ago. And the US looked at the African American and Hispanic population, and they found a similar thing where their native population was at higher risk of contracting soft tissue, both non necrotizing, necrotizing, but increased risk of mortality was not demonstrated. Same with the Maori population in New Zealand. And in the Northern Territory, they had a similar retrospective series where half the cases were ATSI, but mortality as a risk of being Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander was not demonstrated. It's an interesting but controversial finding. Obviously, our ATSI population are high risk of diabetes mellitus and often poorly controlled. And due to multiple other factors, such as cultural barriers and geographical limitations, they seek medical attention late, and that's reasonably relevant for necrotizing fasciitis. So looking at disease factors, so we looked at obviously uh, the precipitant. Uh, the majority was spontaneous, which is, fits with current literature, and the other were post-operative and trauma. And there was no statistical impact on mortality. Um, looking at the location of necrotizing fasciitis, breaking it down to leg, thigh, and perineum. And again, no statistical impact on mortality, but traditionally perineum and genitalia, so fornies, gangrene patients do much worse. This was, I guess, the most relevant finding from our study. So time to surgery was very interesting. Now, Admittedly, it was very hard to um, quantify this because from a retrospective review, you can't clearly document from when the patient arrives to hospital and go to surgery. And we did have a large standard variation. But overall, the average time to surgery in the whole group was 40 hours. And that's close to two days. And that's really, again, not good enough. But that's something that can't be controlled when you're separated by such large distance. But statistically, so this is a the breakdown from where our patients came from. You can see we had some from Papua New Guinea, from the Torres Strait, from the Cape, and then regional Queensland. These were tourists, so they don't really count. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess things to look at why there was such a delay in time to surgery. So geographical location is the obvious one, with 50% being retrievals. Um, I guess the other one is diagnosis. So from the review, it was never clear were these patients diagnosed as necrotizing fasciitis immediately, or were they soft tissue infections treated and then diagnosed. So I think these factors play a big role in why the surgery was delayed and surgical referrals were delayed, and it's quite relevant. The fact that it wasn't statistically significant is relevant, but controversial. Um, average time to surgery, 40 hours, is really quite outstanding. Um, but in the literature review, there was a similar finding in Victoria when they did an audit of their cases of over 10 years at the Prince Alfred. And they found when retrieval was delayed greater than 24 hours, there was no statistical impact on mortality, so which is very similar to what we have found. Again, I think the things that might possibly explain this is, you know, there's varying severity of disease of necrotizing fasciitis. And I guess it's hard to quantify, but the patients have very variable physiological reserve. In our cohort, we had young patients as young as 18 and old patients as old as 80. And obviously, both those cohorts are going to do differently. So it's hard to quantify. Um, breaking it down a little bit further, we looked at microbiology, and again, no surprises, polymicrobial infection was the most common, following closely by streptococcus and staphylococcus. Um, statistically speaking, so an isolated infection with staph aureus, so MRSA or MSSA, did carry statistically higher risk of mortality. Now, this is actually a new trend emerging in the literature. Patients with isolated infection with staph do poorly and do worse. We found rare species amongst our cohort with Vibrio and Eremonis, but that's fitting with a tropical environment. So I guess brief conclusions, time to surgery, no statistical impact on mortality. ATSI population, not at high risk of mortality, despite high risk of developing soft tissue infection. 
And comorbidities, diabetes mellitus remains one of the most significant risk factors in contracting neck fascia and facing mortality. Um, limitations. Admittedly, this is a retrospective review. Not all relevant factors can be looked into, and we're aware of that. Uh, sample size was small, so it gives rise to a large bias, and it's poorly powered. And one of the main things we found difficult to do, which is very relevant, is looking at morbidity, not just mortality. But morbidity is difficult to quantify in retrospective review when patients are lost to follow up. So moving forward, despite the results from this review, early surgical diet still remains the gold standard. Um, diabetes optimization will reduce rates of necrotizing fasciitis and outcomes following contraction. And this is universal amongst other conditions and isn't really new. Um, at the population, they're high risk of soft infection, but I can't really explain why a multiple studies have demonstrated not an increased risk of mortality. I think this needs to be looked at further. And I think another endpoint to look at in necrotizing fasciitis is the impact on morbidity rather than just mortality more closely. Possibly this can be done with some prospective studies. Um, acknowledgements, I'd like to thank Dr. Chem, who's one of the consultant surgeons at Cairn Base Hospital, and Paul Liebenberg, who's one of the senior set trainees. Um, questions, concerns, queries? Oh, sorry. How many of them were actually referred on for hyperbaric therapy? Ah, zero. Yeah. Okay. None. Yeah, none at all. Um, so I guess in the rural setting, what you're saying, uh, anything greater than 40 hours in your study showed no statistical difference in mortality. But I guess a, a review of early IV antibiotics in these cases, was there any thoughts or any, did you see any, sorry? Was there any indication of time for first IV antibiotic administration? Yeah, we found it difficult to document. You know, you'd, you'd see in the notes that IV antibiotics were administered and you'd look back in the medication chart, sometimes the time wasn't documented. So most of these patients received pretty early antibiotics, whether they were diagnosed as necrotizing fasciitis or a cellulitis. Um, so they all had antibiotics early on board and that probably delayed disease progression, which I guess made our analysis difficult. Uh, did you look at any secondary endpoints like... Uh, uh, prognostic factors for extending debridement into amputations or length of stay in ICU, those kind of things? So we looked at how long they stayed in hospital. Uh, we didn't do any statistical analysis. Um, other endpoints we did briefly look at was um, renal failure, inotropic support. But in terms of prognosis, none of those really were statistically significant because all the patients are quite unwell. and We couldn't really f justify putting it in this presentation. I have a colleague who wants to know um, from his hospital bed about the differential diagnoses, please. For necrotizing fasciitis? Yeah, there's a few. So I guess uh, it's a, a form of soft tissue infection and the most common differential is cellulitis. And then obviously you can have erythroceles, which is another differential. And then necrotizing fasciitis um, is I guess the, the most severe form. I was just wondering about reliable signs and symptoms that we could pick up given the importance of early recognition. Sure. So one of the most common is disproportionate pain to clinical findings. So cellulitis is actually right staring in the face, big, swollen, tender leg, necrotizing fasciitis. The objective signs aren't always there, but the patient's got excruciating amount of pain and they're disproportionately unwell. So they'll come in tachycardic, hypotensive, and the signs aren't there. So I think that's one of the hallmarks to look out for and be aware of. And the other thing is to look at the risk factors for patients. If they're elderly, they're diabetic, they're obese, they're smokers, you should have a high index of suspicion. Uh, any seasonal variation, given that it's the wet tropics with mortality? Or yeah, the that's rates? interesting. Um, we didn't actually look into that, but I'm sure it possibly would be. I'm just uh, curious about the finding that time to surgery didn't affect mortality because yep. I guess the flies in the face of my understanding of necrotizing fasciitis which that you can get sort of rapid tissue destruction and the hallmark of treatment is rapid surgical yep. debridement to halt the process and yet you find that time to surgery didn't have an impact yes. on mortality. So how to explain that? So I, th I think it, it's controversial. Um, I think we probably need more patients to find that it probably is statistically significant. Um, 
I think, uh, given it's a retrospective review, we couldn't document it accurately. I think if we'd done it prospectively, we would find that time to surgery is a significant factor. Um, things, if this is a true reflection of delayed time to surgery not impacting mortality, things such as possibly early intravenous antibiotic administration. And as, as I said in the, the talk, maybe the varying physiological reserve of the patients has played a role. If you've got someone who's young and fit, they might be able to withstand, I guess, the disease process longer than someone who's got other comorbidities. So I agree with you. Um, and from this review, I'm not saying that time to surgery doesn't play a role. It absolutely does. Early surgical intervention, early retrieval is the gold standard. I just think it needs to look at a bit more closely. Okay, no worries. Thanks.